We met the first time in 2003 in Barcelona. He was working. Uh, oh, wow. Do uh, you remember? <laughs> I was there working with the Brad Bravo. <laughs> and after that, uh, okay, he defended his uh, uh, PhD thesis and that. And then he, get, he got a position in Tel Aviv, where uh, he was for a couple of years. And after that, uh, he, get a position, he got a position as a single assistant professor uh, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, he's still there. That team, he was working on the uh, uh, Supernova Remnants, and uh, he continued working on that during this year. And recently, he started working on these uh, large surveys, in particular SDS S survey. And uh, today he's going to uh, present uh, some results concerning stellar multiplicity with this large survey. Carlos? Okay. Uh, tante grazie. I, I, I'm very, very happy to uh, be given the opportunity to uh, tell you about uh, this work that I've been doing um, over the past few years. Uh, the only uh, sad aspect of this is that I, I don't get to present it in Teramo. This is what I would like, but uh, you know, uh, this is a, these are strange times. And um, uh, anyway, uh, um, so uh, of course, this is uh, work that I've done with um, uh, my group here uh, in uh, in Pittsburgh. And before I tell you anything about the science, I want to um, you know take a minute to. Uh, thank everyone who contributed and all the funding agencies that made it possible. And especially I want to mention uh, my student, Christine Mazzola, who uh, is uh, going to defend her thesis uh, next summer. And she has been uh, a key contributor to this work. But uh, you know, there are other people here, um, maybe too many to mention individually. So um, most, uh, most things begin with an image. And uh, uh, when it comes to binary systems or multiple stars, you know, for better or worse, you're, you're, you're allowed to think that this is very annoying. But uh, uh, for most people, the image that's in their head, it's this image, right? And it's this, of course, from, uh, from Star Wars. Uh, you can see here the twin sons of Tatooine, right? And this is actually a pretty good picture of a binary system. You have uh, two uh, stars, they're uh, similar to the sun. This one is redder just because it's closer to the horizon, uh, but they're probably going to have uh, uh, a similar temperature. And they're orbiting each other, and this planet, of course, is orbiting the binary system, right? Uh, and uh, this image is planted now in everyone's head, and, and this is why people know that there are multiple systems out there, right? So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, this general topic of closed binary systems. Um, why do we care about them and what uh, are we looking for? Um, the data that uh, these large spectroscopic surveys can bring to this problem, uh, particularly the radial velocities, and some of the results that we've been getting for wide group binaries and multiplicity statistics using um, uh, the Apogee um, spectrograph in uh, within Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, if I have time, um, I don't think I will, but if I have time, I, I, I want to tell you about this uh, extraordinary system that uh, we discovered. But um, if if I get to the end of the talk and uh, we're running out of time, I'll just leave that and then you can ask questions if you want. Um, and then I'll, I'll discuss some implications and future directions at the end. So let's start by defining what a closed binary is. Um, uh, closed binaries, and for the purpose of this talk, are, are any kind of uh, binary system or multiple system that at some point in their uh, evolution will interact. Um, there's going to be mass transfer, and this is going to lead uh, to deviations from the uh, standard picture of single stellar evolution. Okay. Um, now, uh, the most important thing you need to know about these systems is that they're all unresolved. And of course, we all have this mental picture uh, of, you know, uh, uh, a star that's filling its Roche lobe, and, and there's mass transfer through the inner Lagrangian point, and then of course you form an accretion disk because you have to get rid of angular momentum and all that. But no one has ever seen this. And I think before you go on, you, you need to acknowledge this fact. Of course, we have a lot of data from spectra and photometry and time variation, 
And this is a very, it's a well physically motivated picture, but it's still a picture. It's still a mental picture. And anything that comes from this picture, we should always treat with healthy skepticism. Because uh, as I was saying, nobody has ever seen this. Uh, now with ALMA, people are starting to see structures around interacting systems. But even in the best of cases, this is for uh, a picture for Myra, uh, which is only 90 parsecs away. But Myra is a wide system, right? And what kind of accretion you have here is wind accretion. It's not uh, this, this standard picture of, you know, Roche lobe overflow and, uh, and mass transfer through the anal branch endpoint. So, so it's important to remember that. But keeping that in mind, of course, we know why binary systems are important. Um, and this is because they produce all sorts of fun things. Um, but you know, maybe you've been living in a cave for the last four years, but uh, there has been now detections of gravitational wave emission and uh, associated electromagnetic displays from um, uh, in spiraling binary systems. Uh, and these all come from closed binaries. Like, all type one A supernovae come from systems that uh, um, interacted at some point. And this is, uh, as Luciano mentioned, this is the reason why I got interested in this in the first place, right? To try to understand the origin of type one A supernovae. Many core collapse supernovae also come from binaries, but that's not an exhaustive list. Like you have novae, static transients that are being discovered all the time by these new surveys. Um, IMCBN stars, high and low mass X-ray binaries, microquasars, cataclysmic variables, the list just goes on and on and on. And um, uh, here's a picture of a type 1 supernova. One of the very few things we know for certain about this exploding star is that at one point it was a closed binary, right? And, uh, and these are uh, all the, you know, plethora of things that come from these interacting binaries. Um, now, since we mentioned uh, Tatooine and Star Wars, of course, uh, this also, the fact that we have multiple systems also has an impact on planet habitability in the sense that if you have a planet that's orbiting a closed binary system, uh, either in a P-type or an S-type configuration, you know, Tatooine would be a P-type configuration where the planet orbits an inner binary that acts as a point mass. But uh, in any case, now you have to consider Another criterion for habitability, not only radiation from uh, the, the stellar system, which would be the standard concept of the habitable zone, right? But you also need to consider orbital stability, right? So um, uh, this is something that has, a, has an impact on, on uh, studies of astrobiology. Um, now, the way we understand these closed binaries is by looking at what we call the fundamental statistics of stellar multiplicity, right? Um, and these are, one way to think about this is to uh, establish a parallel with the initial mass function. Uh, we all know what the initial mass function is, but um, at heart it's just a useful construct to understand what's going on. There is not a single point in, the, in space where the initial mass function is, you know, accessible to you and, and you can measure it perfectly and it's pristine and, and, uh, and, and and perfect, right? But um, it, it's very useful to understand what's going on. So the role of the initial mass function in this field are, are these, uh, these, they're basically three distributions and one number. Um, the number is the multiplicity frequency, uh, or you can also call it the binary fraction or the fraction of, uh, of multiple systems. And this is just defined as the um, integral of the period distribution for the multiple systems over all periods, right? So it's the first moment of the period distribution. And then the three distributions of the distributions of periods, uh, mass ratios and eccentricities, right? Now, like the initial mass function, we're not necessarily able to measure this perfectly in any particular setting. Now, in terms of understanding these distributions, we really have measured this well and at all periods, only for sun-like stars in the solar neighborhood, right? And there are many studies of this. Um, but when it comes to the multiplicity frequency, we've established some very clear trends. Like we know the multiplicity frequency, the, the number of systems that have uh, companions is a sharp function of stellar mass. Uh, and this is what you see here in this plot. We know that at least for sun-like dwarves in the solar neighborhood, the period distribution is log normal. Uh, with a peak at log P of 5.5. Uh, um, the mass ratio distribution tends to be flat, but uh, there seems to be an excess of twins, uh, and that is um, com uh, 
systems where the components are very close to each other in mass, and the eccentricity distribution seems to um, be uh, dominated by tidal uh, circularization in the sense the eccentricities are, are low for a short period systems and then they become larger for, for longer period systems. Now, without going too much into the details of what these distributions really mean, um, there are really two things that you need to remember about them, and, and they're very important, so I'm going to insist on this. Um, and this comes, if you really want to um, know more about this, I highly recommend this excellent paper by Mo and De Stefano in 2017. It's a long paper, but it really summarizes our knowledge of these things. So the two things that you need to remember about these things is that um, the fundamental statistics of stellar multiplicity are strong functions of stellar properties. That's the first thing. And, and, and this is the obvious example is for the multiplicity fraction as a function of mass. We know that um, O-type, early B-type stars have many more companions than, say, solar-type stars or, or, or M-type stars. Okay. So there are strong functions of, uh, of, uh, of stellar properties. And the other thing that you need to remember is that these statistics are not independent of each other. And if you put these two facts together, you have, uh, you know, one of these classic uh, nightmares in observational astronomy that we deal with uh, these days, right? So you're not allowed to measure this or that parameter and then multiply, right? You really need to measure them uh, all at the same time for a large number of stars with well-determined properties. Um, and this is, as I was saying, a daunting observational problem. So, um, once you've established that, if you can in any way, um, we have a pretty good theoretical idea of what goes on, right? Um, uh, once uh, one of these two components in the system evolves of the main sequence, um, at some point it's gonna feel its Roche lobe uh, and there's gonna be mass transfer. Uh, it's well known that this critical period for uh, Roche lobe overflow is, is that function of radius and mass. And we know the critical period is gonna get um, longer and longer as the stars climb up the red giant branch because the uh, once you have core he uh, hydrogen exhaustion the radius increases and that means this critical period will also uh, increase and and what's going to happen is that if you look at the period distribution in the main sequence for uh, sun-like stars you're going to start eating away at this tail of short periods right so the critical period for large lobe overflow in the main sequence is of the order of a few hours that's the shortest period you can have. I would be the closest the two suns of Tatooine can ever get. And then uh, at the tip of the red giant branch for a sun-like star is more like a few years. And then, of course, you can go uh, even larger uh, in the asymptotic giant branch. You can have, you know, six or seven years. And these are uh, these this, uh, uh, rulers that I've overlaid here on the period distribution. So this is how... The, st the multiplicity statistics and stellar evolution interact with each other, right? Um, now, of course, uh, as, as stars evolve, um, most of these radius increase happens in a brief period of time, right? As the star is climbing the red, uh, the red giant branch. And this is what we have, uh, the standard picture of uh, mass transfer is this case A, case B, and case C mass transfer, where case A uh, is mass transfer during the main sequence, which can happen because the radius of main sequence stars does increase a little bit uh, as the composition of the core switches from hydrogen to helium. Uh, most of the cases we expect would be uh, case B mass transfer, which is mass transfer within, during the red giant branch. Um, then the star will become a core helium burning or red clump star and, and its radius will decrease. And then it's possible to have also case C mass transfer uh, during the aging. Right? Um, what happens then um, is tricky because, uh, uh, well, in case you're uh, wondering, this, this was as a function of radius, this is a function of, of effective gravity, uh, which is easier, easier to measure. Uh, but what, what happens then is tricky because um, in many cases, uh, it depends on the mass ratio, but in many cases, this mass transfer is going to be unstable. So what we think goes on is that um, there's uh, what we call a common envelope phase. And this leads to either uh, the merger of the two components or the birth of a, of a short period system, you know, depending on, on the conditions. And, and this is a problem because as, as many of you know, a common envelope is one of the least uh, understood phases of stellar evolution. 
it is um, a computational nightmare because it has uh, it combines physics going on at very very different scales right so um, there have been uh, a few studies of uh, uh, common envelope evolution but uh, we really don't know how this works from from first principles from an observational point of view uh, there is a whole class of transients that have been tied to these common envelope uh, events. This is a, a very famous picture of the A381, um, and people think that uh, the light echo from the system may have originated in a in a common envelope, um, in a common envelope event. So, what are the open questions that we're addressing? The big open question here is our understanding of these multiplicity statistics, right? As I was saying. Um, we only know these statistics very well at all periods for sunlight dwarfs in the solar area, right? Uh, there have been some studies of um, the relationship between the stellar multiplicity statistics and stellar properties in uh, settings like uh, stellar clusters. But as of a few years ago, there was no panoramic view of the interplay between multiplicity, stellar evolution, and stellar properties in the field, right? And this leaves us with uh, all sorts of, uh, of things you can, uh, uh, you know, stay awake uh, at night about. Um, are our basic ideas about Roche lower flow uh, correct? Um, what is the interplay between stellar multiplicity and environment? Age, stellar composition. Uh, is this related to the formation, uh, to the star formation theory, uh, which kind of predicts how many systems will be born in closed binaries? as a function of the properties of the gas that's leading to the uh, star formation. And more generally, what is the rate of common envelope events in the Milky Way? What is the rate of stellar mergers? Uh, how many of these short period systems are formed? And this is not just an academic question, right? These are the short period systems that are eventually going to lead to type 1a supernovae and gravitational wave sources, right? Um, and, and can we help constrain things like binary population synthesis models for supernovae and gravitational wave uh, sources um, by uh, understanding the basics of stellar multiplicity better. That is, by, by giving these binary population synthesis uh, models better constrained initial conditions. So um, this is where the new data from these large surveys comes in. And uh, basically, uh, the opportunity is very clear, right? Because these are unresolved systems Radial velocities from spectra are still the most efficient probe of stellar multiplicity for periods of log p less than four, right, uh, in days, which is the standard way you you you, interpret, you give the, the period in, in this field. Um, so basically all the progenitors of closed binaries uh, or all the systems are eventually going to interact are gonna give you a strong radial velocity uh, signature. And of course, we have all these large spectroscopic surveys, you know, not only SDSS, but things like RAVE, WEAVE, uh, uh, MSC. Um, and uh, the wonderful thing about these large surveys that uh, observe so many uh, stars is that they have well-characterized uh, pipelines that produce these stellar parameters. And this is very important because as I was saying, you know, you can't really measure the stellar properties and the multiplicity statistics independently. They're tied to each other. So, so you want to be in a setting where you can measure both, right? Um, what is the problem? The problem is that most of these surveys, for reasons of efficiency, just take one or two or three spectra of each star, and they don't stay on each object or each target for enough uh, uh, visits to get uh, an actual orbital, orbital fit. And if you want to fit orbits uh, to get periods and uh, eccentricities and so on and so forth, you really want to do this with at least 10, preferably you know 12 or more radial velocities per star. This is something that I've done in the past. It's a, it's a well-known uh, uh, tool in astronomy, and uh, you know it, it's it's been it, it's been used traditionally for many many years. Now. Um, Back when I was in Tel Aviv uh, working with Dan Mao, since we're, we're both you know impatient Mediterranean types, which uh, I'm sure you guys at Teramo can relate to, uh, we had this idea that, that maybe you don't need to fit the orbits for all the systems in order to understand stellar multiplicity. Right? Maybe if you just have one or two, uh, if you have two or three radial velocities, you can know enough 
about the systems to say something statistically about the underlying population. So that's me having an idea, you know, and, and but the question is, of course, is, is this a good idea? Um, and we'll, we'll see, right? Um, so this started um, uh, when I was in Tel Aviv working with Danny, this started uh, with uh, the White Dwarfs, the White Dwarfs in Sloan. And, and again, historically, as, as Luciano said, I, I came to this field from Taiwanese superior gender. So um, we had an interesting sample of White Dwarfs that had been observed by Sloan, uh, about 15,000 White Dwarfs. And uh, the good thing about this close binaries, uh, this, this um, White Dwarf, White Dwarf binaries, the, the so-called double degenerates, is that the white dwarfs are so small, the system is so close that the radial velocities are very large, right? They can be in excess of 500 kilometers a second. And even with the modest resolution of the optical spectrographs in Sloan, you can really measure this. And here's a picture of, uh, you know, of a white dwarf observed by Sloan that happens to be in a binary, and, and you see how the lines very beautifully move um, and again, this, this, this system was not observed in order to calculate its orbit. In fact, you can't really calculate an orbit, which is five exposures, but you really see that it's a binary, right? So one observational parameter that you can focus on is this delta RV max, which uh, I'm going to define because I'm going to use it later, which is basically the maximum radial velocity minus the minimum radial velocity, okay? And... Um, it turns out that if you measure this delta RV max for enough systems, while you're not able to solve the orbit for any of these systems individually, you can say interesting things about the population of systems. Okay, and this is the measurement that we made back in 2012. Uh, let me show you this uh, histogram because you're going to see histograms of this uh, later in the talk. So when you're measuring very few radial velocities for a very large number of stars, the histogram of this delta RV max parameter usually looks like this, right? You have a core of very large uh, numbers of systems that have very low delta RV max values. And this is because the systems are either not binaries or they're binaries that are too wide for you to observe. Uh, and this core is the shape of this core is basically determined by the statistics of the radial velocity error distribution, right? Now, if you had no binaries in this large sample of systems, what you would expect to see is this dashed line, right? You go, because the errors are large and the number of systems is, uh, is large, you would go to, you know, two, three, uh, two, three, maybe even four sigma deviations from zero, but eventually it would die off. Now, if you do have binaries in this uh, sample, what you're going to see is this tail of very large delta RV max values on top of the core. Now, your ability to say something about the statistics of stellar multiplicity here is predicated on your ability to measure the shape and the normalization of this tail. For the particular case of wide Earth binaries, these are very simple detached systems that just evolve through gravitational wave emission. So you can actually say something interesting about the uh, period distribution if you just measure the shape and the normalization of this tail. In fact, you can constrain the binary fraction and the period distribution just by measuring this tail. Okay, and this is what we did back in 2012. Uh, this is work that we have since revisited by combining two surveys, SDSS, which has very large numbers of white drawers at, at low spectral resolution with SPY, which was a survey done uh, in the ESO telescopes, has fewer white drawers, but a much observed with much higher spectral resolution. And if you combine these constraints, you can uh, sort of measure the combination of uh, uh, period distribution. This alpha parameter is just the power law index in the period distribution uh, that you can parameterize in this way and the binary fraction. And the interesting thing when you combine these two measurements, if you know the binary fraction and you know the period distribution, because this systems just simply evolve through gravitational wave emission, you can predict the merger rate. You can measure the rate at which the stars will merge just by going back and, and, and basically constraining the shape of this tail. Okay? And this is an interesting number if you're interested in, uh, uh, in type 1A supernova progenitors like I am and, and you know, Luciano and Inma and, and Oscar. 
are because this is something you can compare directly to the rate of type 1a supernovae in a typical galaxy like the Milky Way. Right? And it turns out the rate is about an order of magnitude larger, the specific rate, instead of mergers per, um, uh, per year per solar mass formed. Right? So it's a, about uh, an order of magnitude larger. What does this mean? Does this mean that all type 1a supernovae are wide dwarf mergers? No. It means that if you want to explain all type 1a supernovae with wide dwarf mergers, you can. Okay? Um, the uh, hidden thing here is that, of course, we don't know the masses of these merging systems, right? We just measure uh, the radial velocities. Uh, but this is also interesting for other reasons. If you're interested in um, detecting gravitational waves from space with a space interferometer like LISA, the wide dwarf, wide dwarf binaries provide what's called a gravitational wave foreground. So knowing these two numbers, the pure distribution and the binary fraction, observationally, is very important to determine this uh, gravitational wave foreground. And some people have been working on this. And there's a paper coming up uh, in the next few months by someone who's been using our measurements to uh, better characterize this. Um, but this uh, um, study of white dwarfs was just uh, really the beginning for us in stellar multiplicity studies, right? Um, uh, after we uh, looked at the white dwarfs with uh, the optical spectra in Sloan, I started becoming interested in this other survey within Sloan called Apogee. Now, Apogee is a galactic evolution survey. You know, it's a, a, a survey that was put in place. It was designed to study galactic archaeology. What Apogee is doing is it's observing very large numbers of stars in the Milky Way in the infrared at high spectral resolution, say 20,000 or so. And this is a, a picture of an Apogee spectrum. This is data. And as an observer, I, I really have to say the high resolution spectra spoil you forever. You know, it, I don't think I'm gonna be able to go back to the low resolution optical spectra after playing with this, because this is amazing data. Each line here is a real line and you can use them all to measure radial velocities. So you get very, very high quality radial velocities. From this, right? Apogee targets mostly um, main sequence red giants and red clump stars that are say about cooler than the sun say below 6,500 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, its goal is to uh, reach most of the Milky Way disk. And um, the reason they're doing this is they, they, they want the high resolution spectra to, to, uh, to measure abundances, right? but it just ends up being very good news for, for, for us. But uh, this, this is uh, uh, very much a survey that's driven by the galactic archeology span uh, people like Carlos and, uh, and uh, Look at the folks who study this, right? By doing it in the infrared, though, you get to sample a large fraction of the Milky Way disk. And that means you get to measure, you get very high quality measurements for a very wide range of stellar properties, which is what we're interested in, right? Of course, it comes with a pipeline. The pipeline is called ASCAP, and it's actually uh, led by Carlos Ayen de Priero, uh, the uh, Canary Islands Institute. And this pipeline gives you good measurements for things that we're interested in, like the effective gravities, effective temperatures, metallicities, uh, radial velocities, and, and so on and so forth. In order to get a high quality combined spectrum, you have to measure the radial velocities of the individual exposures combined. Okay? And then you can do your abundance studies, but as a byproduct of that, you get these high quality radial velocities, which is what we're interested in. Right. Uh, this is a Hurston Russell diagram of uh, the Apogee sample as of DR13. It is now uh, different, but it gives you an idea. Basically, you're measuring here the main sequence and stars up to almost the tip of the red giant branch, right? In log G and temperature. Um, now, how many individual exposures, how many individual radial velocities do you have per star? Well, some stars have a lot of them. Some stars have uh, 10, 20, 30 uh, individual visits. And for those, if you want, you can calculate orbits. But for the vast majority of the sample, you're talking about two, three, four real velocities. That's 80% of the apogee sample. So you have about half a million stars with just a few real velocities measured and baselines that are uh, anywhere from you know, a day to uh, several years, which is now the baseline of the apogee. Sir. Right? So if you just measure the delta RV max parameter for these hundreds of thousands of stars as a function of effective gravity, what do you get? 
Um, by the way, uh, before I show you the delta RV max, this is a binary observed by Apogee. Just want to reassure you that the spectrograph can measure real velocities very, very well. Like again, this is beautiful data, right? You, you don't need to do any complicated analysis to know that this is a binary. The lines are moving, and they're moved by many resolution elements. So these are not marginal detections. These are uh, really, really solid detections. Uh, um, I think, if I recall correctly, this the real velocity shift between these two spectra here is um, about 10 kilometers a second, and this is almost 100. So this is what you get when you measure this delta RV max parameter as a function of effective gravity, okay? And before I put any lines here, this is what I always tell my graduate students, you have to look at the data first before you do interpretation. So let's, let's see what this is telling us. So this is effective gravity. Here are the dwarfs, log g of four to five. So these are M type, K type, and G type dwarfs mostly. And then uh, uh, these are stars are going up the red giant branch, right? Up all to the tip of the red giant branch, which would be at log g around zero for a sunlight star. And this is the delta RV max, right? Um, you could make histograms individually at any given log g, but what you're seeing here is a clear trend. The, the red dots, by the way, are the red clump stars, the core helium burning stars observed uh, with average. Right? But you clearly see is that the maximum rail, radial velocity shift that you observe is very large for the dwarfs, and it goes down as you go up the red giant branch. And this is exactly what you expect. Right? What we're seeing here is the same attrition of the short period tail of the period distribution that I was telling you about before. Now, in terms of what you expect, of course, the maximum radial velocity shift that you expect to see is uh, uh, determined by the critical period for erosional overflow. The shorter this critical period, the larger the rail velocity shift that you can uh, expect to see. And these uh, lines here just show what the critical period for erosional overflow would be for uh, three stellar models with masses typical of the apogee sample. Okay, uh, 0.5, 1, and 2 uh, solar masses. Now, what you can see is that the data actually uh, behave exactly in the way we would expect. Uh, which is nice. Um, now, if you actually do histograms, this is what you see as a function of log g, right? Uh, uh, these are the dwarfs, main sequence and subgiant stars, and you see that the radial velocity shifts go all the way to several hundred kilometers a second. As log g goes up and up, and you're uh, going up the red giant branch, this tail of high delta RV max distance gets eroded, and eventually when you get to the tip of the red giant branch, which is the red histogram, the dark red histogram, uh, you see that you have lost a lot of these high delta RV max systems because you've lost a lot of the short period binaries, right? Interestingly, if you look at the red clump stars, their distribution of delta RV max is very close to those of the, at the tip of the red giant branch. Um, and this is, of course, exactly what you would expect. Like, remember, you, what you're seeing is what happens to the multiplicity statistics as you go up the red giant branch. And of course, when you get to the red clump, physically, you could have short period binaries. But in reality, you don't, because these stars, remember, they used to be much larger, right? So if you measure the multiplicity statistics here and there, you get that they're very similar. And that's because you've lost all the short period systems as you went up the red giant branch. And again, this is perfectly expected. We knew that this was going to be the case, but it's nice to see it in a large sample that's consistently measured. Now, what about the stellar properties, right? Uh, again, this is what we're seeing. Right? We're, we're seeing this uh, erosion of the short period uh, uh, tail in the period distribution. What about stellar properties? Well, this pipeline measures all sorts of things. Particularly, the pipeline in Apogee was designed to measure abundances. So you can look at the, statistic, uh, the statistics of the delta RV max distribution as a function of metallicity. And if you do that, you see that the low metallicity stars, which are the red histograms, they're um, above the high metallicity stars, which are the blue histograms, essentially at all log Gs that uh, Apogee can measure. Uh, the red plum being an exception. We'll come back to this later. Um, but uh, uh, let me just 
rephrase this and, and make sure that uh, that I get the point through, right? So the metal poor stars in apogee are much more variable in terms of real velocities than the metal rich stars in apogee. And if you actually correct for the biases and, and do uh, all due diligence, and I can tell you about the details if you're interested during the question and answer. What this is telling us is that the closed binary fraction for stars in the field is a strong function of metallicity. It's anti-correlated with metallicity, in fact. Now, to follow up uh, this work that we did with Apogee, Max Moon, Caitlin Crater, and myself uh, put together, uh, you know, different different surveys, and this is the picture that emerges. If you go from metallicity around solar to say Fe over H of minus one, about a tenth. Um, the closed binary fraction increases dramatically. And when I say dramatically, this is not a 20 or a 30% effect, okay? It's a factor of four. You have a factor of four more binaries at low metallicity than you do at high metallicity. Um, if you go all the way to super solar metallicity, it's actually a factor six increase. Okay, and this is a really, really important um, observational um, measurement. Um, now, there's not only metallicity, right? Uh, to follow up this work, my student Christine Mazzola has now uh, looked at the closed binary fraction as a function of many, many other stellar properties, effective temperatures, masses, uh, metallicities, but also alpha abundances, ages. And you can do all this work now because, uh, you know, and that's the difference between our initial work in Apogee in 2018 and what you can do now because now we have the Gaia. Uh, uh, parallaxes, right? So you can fit stellar models to these uh, um, to these targets and, and get this very well. I mean, I'm not going to bore you with all the different uh, things that you can uh, measure here. You can actually read Christine's paper, which is very nice, and uh, everything is, is explained there. But the message here that we see is that of all the properties you can measure in the Apogee sample, composition, chemical composition, is the one that has the strongest effect on stellar multiplicity. Um, here is a blow up of what happens when you measure the closed binary fraction as a function of uh, Fe over H, magnesium, co added alpha abundances, oxygen, silicon. And you see that there's this trend where you um, have these higher values at lower abundances. But the actual details of the interplay between the abundances and stellar multiplicity are quite complex. Um, Christine has also been looking at other things like rotation. I really don't have time to go into this. But basically, what this groundwork has uh, opened up, it has opened up the opportunity to study all this uh, multiplicity statistics as a function of stellar properties. Okay? Um, how are we doing on time? Um, do I have uh, maybe five minutes to show you something interesting, or should I just wrap up and go to conclusions? And do whatever you want. You have ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So I think I can. I think I can go uh, over the the discovery of this system. Um, there. Oh, by the way, uh, this famous system, or <laughs> I like to think of it as, as famous. It's this one, right? The one that I showed you as an example of a binary. Um, uh, so, so I didn't tell you what, what was orbiting this red giant star. But that turns out to be an interesting. So, um, okay. This is a paper that was published in Science, um, I think almost two years ago now. Uh, and uh, it's a system, this system, 2MSJ05, whatever, whatever, um, that we discovered uh, using the few epoch real velocities from Apogee. And it turned out that the companion to this star is not a normal star, but a stellar mass black hole. The lowest mass stellar mass black hole um, known at the time. Now, how can we make this you know, bold claim? Um, as I told you, basically, all that Apogee tells you is that this system has a companion. So the real velocities are changing. They actually change by quite a bit. Um, the peak to peak is almost 90 kilometers a second. So um, uh, what uh, is interesting about this in, in particular? What's interesting about this in particular is that this system is also photometrically variable. 
and this is the assassin photometry for, for the system. And um, one of the challenges of doing this work with few epoch gradle velocities is that you get this delta RV max, and you can say all these things about the binary fraction and its relationship to composition. But of course, this doesn't give you a period, right? However, the photometry does give you a period, a very clear period of 83 days. No? Um, furthermore, uh, we were working on the system just as the Gaia DR2 parallaxes came out. And, and Gaia gives you a parallax. And what the parallax tells you, by the way, the, the period does vary a little bit because the system has spots, but it doesn't deviate too much from, from 83 days. Okay. Um, you do follow up uh, observations to get enough radial velocities to get a period, and you get a period that's actually uh, the same as the photometric uh, variability period, and it's very well determined. But the interesting thing is that with Gaia, you have a luminosity. Right? And for the effective temperature measured by the system, this effective luminosity basically tells you that the primary has to be quite massive. Hmm? Um, and you know this because you, know, you have the parallax, you have the uh, photometry, that means you have uh, an absolute magnitude and a luminosity, if you want to interpret it that way. And uh, um, if you have high rail velocity shifts on a massive primary, you know that whatever is doing the acceleration has to be massive. Um, however, the spectral energy distribution is completely clean. Actually, you can explain all the light that you see from the system just by modeling the red giant. So um, you get to the conclusion that you have a companion that's at least three solar masses, maybe two and a half to three solar masses, and it's completely dark. Okay? There's no light in the ultraviolet. There's no light in the x-rays. So uh, the only explanation for this is that we have a detached black hole red giant system. This is one of those systems that will interact at some point. But uh, it, it isn't interacted yet, right? And uh, this is a good example of the proverbial needle in a haystack, right? That you can uh, find when you look at a large number of systems. And by large, I mean several hundred thousand. Um, we found uh, uh, more candidates, but uh, so far this is, the, this is the best one. And it is a really interesting way to measure black hole masses because, of course, there are huge observational biases built into any black hole study of the uh, in, into any study of uh, black hole masses. If you are only looking at uh, interacting systems or accreting black holes, uh, you are heavily biased towards the more the more massive ones. Same thing if you look at gravitational waves from black hole black hole mergers. The gravitational wave strain is a strong function of mass, so you're you're, you're going to be looking at the most massive ones. This uh, black hole uh, sits nicely in between the. the neutron star and you know then known black hole masses so uh, it's a good um, observational window on the black hole mass function which is uh, tied to core collapse supernova uh, okay so um, i'm basically done with the talk i'm just going to spend two minutes now going over uh, some conclusions and uh, future directions i hope i have convinced you uh, that uh, this combination of large spectroscopic surveys uh, that have radial velocities for individual visits and well-characterized stellar properties is very interesting to look at stellar multiplicity. Uh, there are some papers there for you to, uh, to look at. Um, what we're working on right now is uh, finishing this paper uh, that uh, combines uh, radial velocity measurements and rotation. Um, uh, in the future, uh, I am very interested in doing an observational study or uh, an observational constraint on the rate of case B mass transfer events in the galaxy because this is directly tied to common envelope events like, you know, before I showed uh, V803 uh, V8 Mon, um, but this is V1309 SCO, another uh, candidate common envelope event. And, uh, and again, going back to my roots as uh, a person interested in type 1 supernova progenitors, this is the birth rate of the short period systems that eventually are going to make the type 1 supernovae and the novae and the gravitational wave sources and the cataclysmic variables and so on. So I think it's, it's quite interesting. Um, 
I haven't really talked about this, but the connections to star formation theory are really interesting. The chemical composition of the collapsing gas cloud has a direct impact on the way this cloud fragments and how the tide binaries are, are, are born during the star formation process, right? And a number of people studying this from a theoretical point of view already predicted that a low metallicity, you should, you should have more short period binary systems, which is exactly what, what we see. Um, of course, the discovery of um, compact object binaries uh, and uh, uh, the progenitors of gravitational wave sources is interesting also because um, when you're looking at the rates of things like gravitational wave events, uh, you're looking uh, at high enough redshift that the composition of the galaxies where these events are, are, are happening is very different from that of the Milky Way. In particular, it goes to much, much lower metallicities, right? Uh, so um, the pool of binaries where these uh, systems are being drawn from, from that you observe a high, red, a high redshift is going to be very different, uh, right? And I'm going to just leave my summary here. I know it's 99 over... Uh, 953 now. So um, I want to make sure that people have the chance to ask questions if you have if, if you have them, and I'm, I'm just gonna zip it and uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much. Questions, comments. Can you hear me? 